everyone always talks about the best ever games for a system, or their all-time favourites, and some games get sadly forgotten. So spare a thought for those games that were left on the shelf 15 years ago, after everyone went straight for Sonic Adventure, Soul Calibur, House of the Dead 2 and Virtua Fighter 3. All of which are great games, don't get me wrong, I just consider it my civic duty to shine a light on the underdogs of the Dreamcast's launch lineup. But first, some honourable mentions. Pen Pen, also known as Pen Pen Tri Isolon, a quirky little game where you run, belly slide, and swim in races as bizarre mutant Antarctic animals. It can be good fun, and sometimes challenging despite the kiddie aesthetics. But sadly, with only four courses, with easy, medium, and hard variants thereof, it's too short to hold your attention for long. Especially as the only unlockables are dress up items and one character with an apparent sinuses infection. Millennium Soldier Expendable. Hey Hollywood, thought you were being clever by naming your action hero stereotypes The Expendables? Well, this game beat you to that joke over a decade earlier. This game has you literally playing as multiple clones of two super soldiers, I guess to explain away the having multiple lives concept, as you mow down wave after wave of aliens. It can be oddly cathartic to play, but the lack of variety in the environments doesn't help the repetitious gameplay, so you'll probably tire of it by the end. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Let's get ready to rumble! Ready to rumble boxing. Remember EA's face breaker from a few years back? I wouldn't blame you if you don't. It was a bit of a flop. But Ready to Rumble is the kind of game they were trying to emulate. Not quite Punch Out, not quite Fight Night. It's an arcade style boxing game that sits firmly in between the two styles. A great game, but the main reason I didn't include it in the list is that its sequel, Round 2, proved to be vastly superior to the original. And even if it wasn't, the fact that you can play as, or beat up on, Michael Jackson, Shaquille O'Neal, and Bill and Hillary Clinton of all people, means it automatically wins. Unfortunately, neither has PJ and Duncan anywhere in the soundtrack. What a missed opportunity. With this groove, I can't lose. Ah! Toy Commander. Certainly not lacking in imagination or creativity, this game is great fun to play. It's just a shame that the controls can range from competent to almost unplayable, depending on your choice of vehicle. And with set mission times to beat before you can advance, you'll find the fun frustration balance tipping in the least desirable direction. Fun fact, the developer, no cliche, used to be Adeline Software, responsible for the Little Big Adventure games, or Relentless if you're American. The team split up in 2004. Surprise, we're never getting Little Big Adventure 3. This saddens me immensely. Mortal Kombat Gold! Just missing out on my five picks is what was supposed to be the definitive version of Mortal Kombat 4. Apparently the graphics are inferior to the arcade version and it contains unwanted glitches and bugs. Not that I knew about these at the time I bought it, I was just keen to play since I kinda lost interest in the series after MK2 on the Mega Drive. I had some good times with it though, and I liked it enough to play through the game with every character to see each of their endings and fatalities. But I admit it's been superseded by its sequels, so MK Gold isn't an essential purchase. And some of those endings were just plain stupid. The Black Dragon died with Kano. You're the last one, Jarek. Never! What was all What? Wait, wait! This is brutality! You can't do it! Wrong, Jarek. This is not a brutality. This is a fatality. What was all Anyway, without further ado, in no particular order, my five picks. Power Stone! The fighting game scene was hardly stale in 1999, but this didn't stop Power Stone from feeling like a breath of fresh air. It had vastly different game mechanics, in that to increase your chances of winning, you had to actually run away from your opponent. By picking up three of the titular gems from around the stage, or by beating them out of your rival, your character can change into their powered up form and use special transformation attacks for a short while. The wacky designs for these forms are very reminiscent of comics, anime and sentai shows, ranging from a robotic lightning wielding samurai, to a martial artist capable of throwing scream filling balls of power, to a giant clobbering rock monster. 
throw in guns, special items, and interactive objects around the stages, and you've got one hectic brawler. Now you might be thinking, a fighting game where you run around using items? Sounds like a Smash Brothers ripoff to me. Well, yes, the original Japanese release of Super Smash Brothers does predate the arcade release of Power Stone, but only by a month, so they were developed around the same time. Plus, each game does have enough to differentiate itself from the other. Smash Brothers was always meant to be a four-player game, whereas Power Stone is a more focused one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Sure, the pyrotechnics do get a bit wild when a player's powered up, but it's rarely difficult to make out what's happening on screen. The game proves to be very well balanced. Before nabbing the stones, each fighter has a limited number of moves, so it's up to you to make the most of your environment. Agile characters can jump around rapidly and swing off beams and poles, while the heavier characters can rip up those beams and swing them several meters in front of them. And while the balance tips heavily in a powered up player's favour, skill can be used to dodge their projectiles and special moves, or the brave can rush them head on and beat the remaining energy out of them. While not as perfectly pure a fighting game experience as, say, Soul Calibur, Power Stone does enough right to make it stand out as its own unique experience. There's also plenty for the single player to unlock in the form of extra fighters, character endings, weapons, three VMU minigames that unlock bonus artwork and sound tests, plus extra options such as tweaking transformation power, an over-the-shoulder camera view, playing with five Power Stones and more. While many people, myself included, consider the four-player Power Stone 2 to be superior to the original, Power Stone does provide a different experience, it being two-player only. It's true I do find the sequel more fun, but the original game works better as a competent fighting game compared to Power Stone 2 throwing hundreds of items and huge multi-tiered stages and hazards at the player for maximum mayhem borderline party game. A couple of factoids, there was a Power Stone anime that ran in Japan in 1999 and eventually released on Region 1 DVD in 2003, sadly with dub only and remade English intro song. Oh hell yeah, time for a bit of kick-ass Eurobeat! Cheese. The cheese! Also, the headline character, Falcon, had his name changed in all Power Stone properties from Fokker, for obvious reasons. Although, if you're looking for potentially offensive names, they left the obvious one right there. I mean, come on, Wang Tang. Come on now, Capcom. Instead of another Street Fighter 4 update, how about giving us Power Stone 3? Please? Average price on eBay, between 5 and 10 pounds. TRICK STYLE! Back to the Future 2 posited that the far-flung future year of 2015 would be the year of the hoverboard. So, with 2015 mere months away, what better time to play a futuristic hoverboard racing game? Trick Style was actually developed by Criterion Software of Burnout fame and is their first ever console release. You'll find yourself racing and pulling off tricks across three locations, the UK, the USA and Japan. Each area has five courses and one boss challenge in the velodrome, which acts as the hub world. There are also bonus challenges against your coach that unlock new tricks and boards. Each of the nine riders you can choose has their own stats, but you can basically boil it down to three types, slower yet stronger, faster but weaker and all-rounders. The lack of polygons on the character models can be a tad off-putting, but their voices give them enough character. Although said character is effectively punch-out style mild racial stereotypes. Sexy femme fatale wearing elegant ballroom mask? French. Guy dressed as the Red Ranger? Japanese. You get the idea. Although I have to give him credit for making Angel the teenage blonde cheerleader type British and not American. The levels are well designed, with hard to reach pathways and shortcuts, it's just a shame there's not that many of them. To counteract this, the difficulty level is very high. While there's no tournament structure and no penalty for losing, you won't be able to advance in each area without placing first in every race. And typically you won't be gaining massive leads, you'll be scraping to victory, barely holding off others behind you. And the most sadistic choice of all is having an arcade-style timer with checkpoint extensions on top of the other races. I swear, I once was in the ridiculous position of causing a bit of a pile-up, still holding everyone at bay, but then having the timer run out and losing the race despite being in first place. 
So just bear in mind, if you plan on beating Trickstar, you're in for a bit of a rough ride. Especially as you may find the controls to be a tad sluggish. Think like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, where you have to hold down the jump button and release it to jump, so you have to plan your jumps in advance. So you'll be needing to keep your eyes on what's ahead of you at all times. But if you do get stuck, you can take a break with the velodrome challenges, or change locations. The presentation's a bit of a mixed bag too. While the themes and art design are nice, the frame rate does take a bit of a hit, dropping sometimes below 30 thanks to some slowdown. The EDM based soundtrack is okay, giving it a similar feel to Wipeout, but the gameplay is nowhere near as fast or smooth. But it's still worth a look if you like Wipeout or Sonic Riders and fancy a challenge. Price on eBay? A modest £2 to £4. Pounds. Dynamite Cop! Did you know there was at one point going to be a Streets of Rage 4 on the Dreamcast? Tragically, it got cancelled fairly early on, but there were a few beat em ups made to fill the void. This is one of them. Dynamite Cop, or Dynamite Cop, is the sequel to Dynamite Decker on the Sega Saturn, which was rebranded in the West as Die Hard Arcade. The license was dropped for this sequel though, so John McClane goes back to being Bruno Dellinger, assisted by Gene Ivey and Eddie Brown, as they take on a gang of Caribbean pirates aboard a cruise ship and their island hideout in an attempt to save the president's daughter from Wolf Hongo, the first game's villain. The game doesn't take itself seriously at all, with the ability to pick up any bits of food, furniture, or any other items not nailed down, to use as weapons. Interesting to note that the PAL game almost seems as if it tries to hide this fact. The box just offers a simple description of your mission, whereas the American box plays up to it, using the fact that you can use pork bones, vacuum cleaners and hairspray as weapons as a selling point of the game. Oh don't worry, there are actual guns too, from simple handguns up to mini mushroom cloud causing anti-ship missiles that you're somehow able to launch by hand. The sound effects are great, if a little cheesy, with comical punch noises, along with smashes and explosions. The music's pretty good, the dramatic orchestral themes give you a sense of urgency when progressing. Also, this game features an early use of QTEs, before Shenmue would even coin that term in fact, where you'll be prompted during short cutscenes to quickly press a specific button. Success rewards you with very satisfying multiple action replays and split screen effects as you clobber the bad guys and narrowly dodge obstacles. As well as bonus illustrations, which you'll need to find via beeps through your VMU, you can unlock the classic 1980 Sega arcade game Tranquilizer Gun. You can also play through the game with a friend cooperatively, although it does pull a double dragon and make you fight each other at the end of the game for no reason other than the sick amusement of the president's daughter. The game certainly has its flaws though, namely being an arcade port, it's very short and can be beaten in around 45 minutes. However, you do get the option to play three different missions, which amount to the angle of assault on the cruise ship, so each mission sees you progressing through different rooms aboard the ship to add a bit of variety. If you do plan on getting this, you should be aware that the PAL version gives you limited credits, and thus is a bit harder to beat, whereas the US version is free play. There is actually another lesser known sequel called Dynamite Decker EX, Asian Dynamite, although unfortunately this was arcade only. However, it could be argued that it's more of a graphical reskin than a proper sequel. Although if you want more Bruno, he made a couple of cameo appearances in House of the Dead 2, and more recently, Project Cross Zone. Price on eBay? A little bit more pricey, 15 to 20 pounds. Although copies being sold in the UK are rare, you may have to import from Europe or the US. Speed Devils! Back when Ubisoft was a much more wholesome company, they developed this not very fondly remembered arcade style racer. And guess what? It's a cracker of a game. It borrows elements of Road Rash with the quirky characters who become your rivals, and race courses seemingly inspired by the cruising games. The cars aren't licensed, so expect a range of imitation Cadillacs, taxi cabs, 4x4s, the usual. You'll start out the championship mode with a heap of junk car in dire need of repair, but it'll do to win enough money for repairs, and then you'll start winning as you discover how brilliantly smooth the difficulty curve is. There's plenty to spend your winnings on in the shop too, with multiple tyre types, engine upgrades, nitro boosters and more. Speaking of winning money, it's not just placing first in races that'll land you cash, you can also perform certain tasks to win bonus bucks. 
Tasks such as driving fast enough in certain spots to bust speed radars, spending the longest amount of time in the lead, setting the fastest lap, etc. But it's the track design where Speed Devils truly shines though, as you'll be racing through volcanic caves and booby-trapped Incan temples in Mexico, zipping around the scenic hills of Aspen as hang gliders and red arrows-esque aerobatic displays soar overhead, and drifting around giant animatronic, I assume, models of King Kong, Jaws and a T-Rex in Hollywood. And that's just in the first round of the championship. Later on you'll be careening around New York, Quebec and Las Vegas, among others. Most, if not all of the tracks, also have hidden shortcuts to find. And as you steadily gain more cars, the racing gets faster and trickier. Rival racers will also pop into your garage occasionally and make bets with you in addition to the regular races. While there aren't a huge amount of courses compared to modern races, there is some variety added by utilising different times of day and weather effects, which sometimes creates new shortcuts. For example, being able to drive over a frozen lake. The frame rate isn't fantastic, but remains a rock solid 30 frames per second throughout. The music is evocative of 70s cop shows with elements of funk, rock and jazz. People do tend to complain that the races are too long compared to other arcade or kart races, with some races being over 10 minutes long. But this is cut down when you get faster cars, and if you're at all used to races in games like Forza Motorsport, you'll have the patience for it. There was actually an updated version of the game brought out later called Speed Devils Online Racing, which, you guessed it, added online multiplayer. But since the servers are long dead, there's really no need to get it over the original. Plus I've heard stories of the graphics being slightly worse to ensure a smooth online experience, so I wouldn't bother with it personally. You can still play split screen 2 player in the original game anyway. Price on eBay? Between 4 and £6. Blue Stinger! Oh boy, now this one I'll catch some flack for. Blue Stinger is technically a bad game. It's very much a poor man's Resident Evil. The graphics aren't great, the camera is rarely accommodating, the story is fairly bland, the characters are not very likeable, the dialogue is terrible, and the voice acting isn't good either. The bosses are feeble, and the regular enemies lack variety and are pretty pathetic. The dramatic music is awkward and unfitting, the pacing is awful, the difficulty curve can spike up and down at random, and the puzzles can be either pointlessly boring or annoyingly obtuse. I seem to remember this game getting above average reviews at the time, ranging from 6 to 8 out of 10 typically, and when I first played this 15 years ago, I naively carried on through it, ignoring the glaring faults. Looking back at the game now, not only do I see the obvious errors, but new ones raise their ugly head in this day and age, so it's technically worse. And yet, there's something I've grown to love about Blue Stinger. Some utterly baffling design and aesthetic choices clash atrociously with the tone of the game. Some of the worst dialogue I've heard since Resident Evil 1 and House of the Dead 2 – okay, maybe the delivery isn't as bad, but the script certainly is – literally had me laughing aloud one minute, jaw dropped the next. If you're anything like me, you'll feel compelled to struggle through the crappy controls and dodgy cameras to see what horrendously out of place thing the game will throw up next. Like a car crash between an Aston Martin and a Sinclair C5, you'll be amused and confused by the sheer spectacle of it. Why? I'm not sure. It's like an underperforming child. You know its heart's in the right place, but you're just willing it to do better. I call it the deadly premonition effect. And get this, Activision, bloody Activision of all companies, allegedly improved the game before it released in the West. The cameras in the Japanese version are fixed perspective, a la classic Resident Evil, and most of the time you can't see what you're doing, as action, if you can call it that, will be going on off camera. To alleviate the camera woes, Activision moved the camera behind the character to give a constant third person view, which would be great if this didn't create its own problems. A lot of the game takes place in claustrophobically cramped corridors, and the camera will get pushed above your head and stare straight down like it's going through your hair for nits whenever the camera is forced up against a wall, or, more crucially, a door, like when you first enter a room. And when you hear monsters in a room, you'll have the worst possible angle and sometimes be forced to fire blindly in front of you in vague hope of hitting something. So yeah, swings and roundabouts. But enough beating around the proverbial bush, let's throw back the curtain and reveal the ugly naked truths. First off, just look at the character models. The textureless skin and unconvincing joints make them look like Ken and Barbie dolls, and in what is supposed to be a survival horror, with deformed corpses lying around and excessive blood spurting from monsters constantly, something just doesn't gel. And for some reason that is beyond me, Blue Stinger features a bit of cross-promotion with another Dreamcast game. What would be a good fit to advertise in this game? House of the Dead? 
Soul Calibur? Virtual Fighter? Nope, it's Pen Pen. But King Pen Pen? Why? Did Climax Graphics owe General Entertainment a favour? A short way into the game, you're forced to search for various characters from Pen Pen as part of the Pen Pen Stamp Rally. Oh, and this takes place in a supermarket at Christmas time with jolly holiday music throughout. Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday! Let's join in the Happy Market Christmas Stamp Rally now! Yay! Ugh! Now imagine if in Resident Evil you're short on ammo or health items. Imagine if you could just enter and exit a room over and over, melee an enemy to death repeatedly, complete with inexplicable flame kick, farm in for coins that shower out from their body Scott Pilgrim style, then take all your money and shove it into a vending machine and buy stupid amounts of canned drinks and ammo clips that you can somehow carry around with you. Because that's exactly what you'll be doing here. And the dialogue, oh my god the dialogue. Setting aside any potential ludonarrative dissonance issues here one may take with the aforementioned punching mutants to death, despite allegedly being an ordinary rescue guy, Elliot Ballard is not exactly what I'd call an aspirational hero. Both him and his sidekick, Captain Dogs Bauer, have questionable attitudes when it comes to females. Now I don't particularly want to add fuel to the feminist issues fire, but just listen to what I've got to work with here. Over there! Janine? A woman? Who the hell is Janine? My kind of girl, so stay away from her. What's the code? My sweetheart. I guess she doesn't understand jokes. I love these kind of chicks. After a bit of research, I actually found out that the poor dialogue is actually identical to the Japanese version. The English dialogue was made for the original version and subtitled in Japanese. This explains a lot, actually. Now, I'm not saying some kind of gross generalization like the Japanese subconsciously have more sexist undertones in their approach to script writing, but if this game is examined in a vacuum as an example, it doesn't exactly make a good impression. But I'm just barely scratching the surface. There's so much stupid stuff in this fascinating game. I've got to do a more in-depth review on this sometime in the future. I only intended to record about 15 minutes or so of gameplay, but I got sucked in for a couple of hours somehow, and something's calling me back to it. The only semi-interesting fact I can tell you about Blue Stinger is the voice cast is actually made up of who were, at the time, the current Sonic voice actors. Janine King is voiced by Lani Manella, who voiced Rouge the Bat. You know, at this point, nothing surprises me anymore. My name's Janine King. Nice to meet you, Elliot. What was that all about? And look what you did to my emerald! Dogs Bauer is the late Dean Bristow, who voiced Dr. Eggman. Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. You fool. Away, before I make mincemeat out of you. And Elliot G. Ballard is played by Ryan Drummond, who also played the Blue Blur himself. So if you wondered what Sonic's voice actor's natural voice sounds like, there you go. Uh, corpses? Did you say there are a number of corpses around? Watch out! You're gonna crash! Ah! eBay price? Three to six pounds for the Japanese or US versions, a bit more pricier for the PAL one, six to nine pounds. So there you go. Combine these games with the best sellers like Sonic and Soul Calibur, and you've got a pretty damn good launch lineup. Dare I say it, the best selection of games for a console's launch we've ever seen. Compare these to the likes of Rise, Son of Rome, or Knack. And it's hard to disagree, right? Although I'm sure people will. If you can think of a better launch lineup, let me know in the comments.